Hey everyone, welcome back to another AI conversation. I'm pleased to be joined today uh, by none other than Ms. Leia Besa Jimenez, Chief Data Privacy Officer of the PLDT Group. Uh, I've actually run across uh, Leia in many in many capacities in the past. She used to be in the advertising media sector, now in telecoms. So welcome to the show, uh, Leia. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe for the one to two people who don't know you, because you're pretty famous, <laughs> give a brief background <laughs> of yourself and what do you do? Wow. And then let's talk about interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, well, my current role right now is the Chief Data Privacy Officer of the PLDT Group. Uh, I've been, it's going to be seven years by Feb of next year, actually. Wow. Congrats. Already. Uh, that, I've, that I've held the role, no? Um. Uh, prior to that, I was actually, uh, you're right, I was actually in the advertising, the media, right? I used to be the CEO of Starcom. And prior to that, I used to actually handle the ad tech business uh, of uh, smart, right? Uh, building basically solutions uh, for advertising, for mobile solutions, mobile advertising solutions. Um, and it's really been, you know, people ask, what is the connection? Right, but do I roll now with everything that uh, that I've done in the past? I've actually done as well uh, the digital part, where you know handling uh, an agency, being uh, it's over, it's basically it's MD, right, which has heavy production. Uh, we were the ones that started uh, social media community management. I feel so I feel so dated already. <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> back in the back in the day, right, and. Uh, you know, a lot of when when people ask me what is the connection with what you're doing today, parang it, I pivoted so much, or, or I, it's such a, it's such a far, uh, uh, far out, uh, application of my skill set. I said it's always been about the data, mm -hmm. right? If you look at all of my roles, and I think that's where we actually intersected a lot of times, right? In my previous, in all of my roles, it's really about discussion on about the data and I think that is really the the, the 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 thread that binds or that that runs through all of the all of my iterations so far right? yeah I was going to react now it's all always been a data job just different aspects of it exactly and yeah and may, maybe to bring up current events though I think uh, I saw you but we didn't meet at a recent event with Hyper Island. And obviously, yeah. I think that's a great framing for our chat today. Uh, AI, no? Um, I think about a week ago or more, just less than two weeks ago, the EU finally agreed, although I don't know if the countries have adopted it, but they finally agreed on their landmark AI uh, act, which in many, many people are saying is like the GDPR moment for AI. Yes. Similarly, in a few years ago, that's how privacy started to become uh, a major part of everyone's lives. So what's your reaction as a, as a privacy officer to the AI app? And maybe talk about how you're kind of thinking about AI now, no? From not, not just in your role, but generally speaking right. as a privacy practitioner. Actually, a lot of the things with the AI app is very close to the GDPR, right? In that it is requiring you to actually do an assessment. In privacy, we call it the privacy impact assessment. In the um, AI Act uh, that's in the EU, it is now, it's called the fundamental rights impact assessment, right? But privacy is greatly part of that assessment, right? So any uh, practice of, uh, let's say, governing AI actually can stem or can start from your privacy practice especially if you have a very mature one in your organization to date, right? Uh, because it is still talking about the same things in terms of accountability, transparency, right? Uh, uh, security, all of those things need to be in place. Um, so what does that mean for us uh, in terms of a practitioner? We've actually applied the same principles in privacy before the... AI Act is uh is 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 out no, uh and local legislation as as you know and as I said this as well during uh, Hyper Island legislation will always uh fall behind the actual technology 
right? Uh, it's faster now, uh, but it will always, I think, uh, we it is incumbent on the user, right, the company, to actually govern ourselves properly. Uh, and privacy is a good uh, springboard to actually AI governance, right? Because you're looking at, uh, again, AI uh, privacy is part of the things that you need to look at when you talk about an AI uh, an AI implementation. So it's a good, all of the principles um, of, let's say, accountability, transparency, hold true in terms of AI, right? And also looking at legitimate purpose, uh, it, still, it still holds true when it comes to AI. Yeah, using the PIA you know, as a, I guess, a, a springboard is a good idea. But can you talk a little bit about how the, like, how did the PIA become a thing? So if I, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not necessarily a hard requirement per se, no? but I know that it's already kind of a, sort of a hard requirement in procurement, let's say in government. It actually like, is. Already? Okay. It actually it actually is a requirement, right? I mean, in terms of, it's not like the, the uh, government will, um, you know, in terms of its enforcement, we, you will have to submit it before you actually implement. Yeah. It is expected. So if you read the DPA, there is an expectation that you have actually done it, right? A level of the assessment has been done. Documentation is another thing, right? Of course, ideally, you document it properly. Right, but a level of assessment is expected, similar to a level of a certain level of security is expected under the DPA. So um, the PIA is actually the rigor of doing that, um, similar to let's say again from a from an AI standpoint when we look at it when we do the assessments for uh, because AI is a tool and a process change, right? So we look at it in those two angles. Now we actually have to look at um, to look at the project deeper than any normal project because of the possibility of um, uh, biases, right? Uh, given the computing power of the tool, uh, the potential biases that it could create as a result of that processing, is what we safeguard, right? So, for example, one of the and I talked about it as well in in Hyper Island, is um, we actually have a project for um, customer care when it comes to credit, right? When you're following a payment, so th these are normal, these are normal transactions, and you normally have a decision tree, right? So those things, while those things are um, quite known already. We actually go to the rigor of going through what are you going to, uh, what are the rules, what are the business rules, right? When you uh, when you apply this tool, when it is when the uh, subscriber says this, what is the response? So we go to that rigor because what the, that's where the biases actually can come out, right? And um, and at the same time, in the event that there is, we did not, we did not, uh, the proponents did not map out a particular response, what happens, right? You can't let the tool just run wild and provide solutions, right? Because then all the more it can potentially create bias and discrimination against the, the subscriber. And that's what we don't want, right? And um, so in that instance, they will actually go to a human. There's going to be human intervention already, right? And that's important. That's very critical because that means that there is some form of control, right? You don't let the tool run wild. Um, but I mean, when it comes to doing, uh, particularly for that, <clears throat> for that uh, particular implementation, the data accuracy, right, of... Uh, of what was being loaded into the tool had to be, uh, you know, in terms of the the percentage of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, it's not being of it not being accurate has to be very low because we want to prevent again a lot of the discrim a lot of the 
issues when it comes to uh, potential um, use of AI comes from the data accuracy uh, that we actually input into it, right? So again, garbage in, garbage out. That's the thing. In your, in your experience, you say <clears throat> you've touched on several aspects now, other apart from the security and the, the privacy of, of the data, you're talking about the quality. Yes. You're talking about uh, unintended consequences of the rules. Is that the did you see that kind of a natural extension of a of a privacy role, or is this something that is there another role that needs to exist to do kind of all of that, or well, is this where the business needs to step in and be more uh, accountable for those things? Okay, so two schools of thought. You can actually privacy can be a stand-in for governance of AI, but depends on the scale that you're implementing AI, okay. right? If you are implementing uh, AI, in, depends on the organization, right? If the scale of your operations is AI-led, then I think, I personally think, then you should have a governance team just focus on AI, yep. right? And maybe privacy is subsumed within because it is a subset, eh? right? Um, for us, there is no, at least in PLDT group, we have not uh, set up, uh, you know, we have not set up a group yet, uh, but there is talk about setting up something, mm -hmm. but privacy becomes the default at this point. Because again, we look at, we look at the way we do the, pri okay, going back to the privacy impact assessment, the core of the privacy impact assessment is really the data flow. Right, so it's really understanding from acquisition to storage to disposal, and if you look at before the disposal part, right, AI focuses as well on that, right. But if we have to go deeper because of the power, right, uh, of uh, of of the tool potentially, then you could. Uh, you could actually uh, provide the wrong service or something that again this can discriminate against the subscriber and that's what we are uh what we are um guarding against you see that some data i mean even in <clears throat> kind of without ai you know some data are more important than others as far as privacy is concerned in when you bring it to ai it becomes even more the case for example biometric data becomes very very Oh yeah, that's yeah, the sensitive person information. Yes, uh, and then uh, I'm just gonna think. Uh, I know, uh, um, parang lateral examples. No? In a in a database, for example, uh, it's easy for someone to implement an opt out, like don't put me in the database, or at least mask me when you put me there. But once you've trained data into a model. As far as I know, parang hirap naman yata, ang hirap na mag opt out. I think this is a big challenge. For example, in the image generation tools, no, and mm. people are saying copyright infringement yan, and literally short of throwing out the entire model and retraining a totally new one, it's going to be hard to edit out, let's say, any example of a Picasso coming through. So, do you see that, uh, or how would you react to that from a privacy standpoint? Because that gets really murky and complicated later on, no? once models start getting developed. Okay, in terms of the implementation, again, I will just focus on how we've implemented AI so far, right? Sure. We always insist on, um, we always insist on transparency and uh, explainability, Yeah. right? So that we can trace. It's really about the traceability of the data, right? And if we need to remove that means we remove from all systems that actually attach to it. So we would we would insist on the same rigor when it comes to AI, right? So again, because that means that it has to be it has to be developed with the ability to actually make those edits, mm. right? Because if you don't, then you run the risk of what you you said. Then how do you how do you decouple it from what you you've already developed, right? You need to be able to do that. Yeah, right. one of the so if, 
I mean, just to share, no, some just to elucidate the topic because I'm sure it's it's bound to give a lot of people headaches. Uh, I think this was just forty eight hours ago or more. Uh, Microsoft started to release uh, some built for purpose. They call them small language models because oh. these large language models were trained on everything in the internet, and therefore it ingested all the the stuff, good and bad, <laughs> in right. the internet in the quest to come up with uh, a decent a model that can decently communicate and uh, converse. But what these researchers are showing is you don't need all of the crap on the internet to come up with a decent communication tool. You can have built for purpose, uh, you know, chatbots uh, that ob- obviously are smaller, easier to deploy, right. use less power. But yung, yun nga lang, there's a higher requirement on the on the domain expertise. Kunyari, gagawa ka ng medical chatbot, you better have some doctors around no, to, yeah. to design that. As opposed to the one-size-fits-all, throw everything in it, even the kitchen sink. So, I guess, from a, again, it's going back to impact assessment, that might be a dimension that that's completely new or needs to modify certain parts of existing uh, assessments. Uh, any thoughts around how we would go about doing There's that? There's actually the AI Act actually provides the list already, if I'm not mistaken, on all the areas that uh, you need to look at right. when it comes to the fundamental rights. Mm-hmm. And it actually is so encompassing. Because again, if you look at uh, AI and how it affects, it affects the human the human condition, yeah. right? And this is what I, I was saying as well during during that, that, uh, that session. Uh, it affects the human condition. Therefore, it has to be encompassing because we need to make sure that we are not discriminating, right? We are not providing it will not with the biases, right? Are not there when we're evaluating, uh, when the tool is doing the processing, because it can happen. It can definitely happen. So there is this uh, there is this case, right? YouTube had uh, was applying uh, AI and. All it, all it, the rules that they, they, they actually just said was, okay, you need to increase engagement, right? But by increasing engagement, it actually was serving content that was um, extreme, extremist, mm-hmm. right? Content. Therefore, because, of course, because they know that people who are exposed to uh, this type of content will, be, will really spend more time on the platform. But that is exactly something that we need to guard against, right? So they had to change. They had to put in more rules. So the there has to be, uh, if you look at the tenants, I think of safety on on AI, being able to sp- uh, the specification is so critical, right? When you do the actual uh, the actual uh, order, right, to the tool, you need to be able to specify what are the business rules what are the boundaries that you're setting boundaries you're setting because if you don't then the tool by because of how it is how it is made will just figure it out right we'll figure out based on the goal that you've actually indicated and it, it will not care right about putting those guardrails unless we are therefore our responsibility is to put in those guardrails when we do the business rules, right? So another tenant, I think, of um, of uh, AI security would be assurance, mm-hmm. right? So this is where we are able to trace back what is actually being processed so that we know uh, that we can actually uh, fix, right? Or edit certain things and make sure that Whatever we, whatever objective we put out, we are actually getting. But from from also from you know checking from a from an audit standpoint, are we really getting what we sought out to do? Right. And then you have as well robustness of the data. I mean, this is where your accuracy comes in, and you know in terms of uh, your confidence level of the actual prediction. I mean, those are I think the three areas of safety that people need to look at when it comes to AI. Yeah, so just listening to the and these are all really good ideas no, to, to implement. It seems like the if the impact assessor, uh, which starts with the privacy officer, would really need to be quite familiar 
with the intricacies at least yes. uh, enough to provide some sort of a taxonomy no? Para, okay let's let's look at the spec right. the specs no the, the specification of the model do you how do you see that playing out no when we start implementing because maybe cursory assumption is the the practices of kunyari mga data analysts the data scientists don't necessarily mix quite often with the privacy set naman who are probably more compliance driven audit driven with a few exceptions may not even have had uh actual experience no so i'm just trying to see we need the 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 practitioner of the future to be a blend of the two no do yes. you have any thoughts in uh, on that and how we could well, encourage that fortunately the way we built uh well i'm one i'm not a lawyer right okay. so my background uh, as you know is from a data standpoint and prior, I mean, in terms of the actual uh, iteration of that prior to this role was really in terms of product. Yeah. Right? So my team is also composed of that. These are product people that actually made the shift to doing privacy. So uh, we are already in itself a hybrid. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're right in that people handling privacy or handling AI governance needs to understand the technical because we question again the level of detail that we question is the uh you know it practically questions whether you unfortunately to some people questions whether you know exactly what your systems are doing yeah right which is not normal i think from a compliance standpoint right the level of understanding and but the thing is if you're guarding against biases and discrimination and protecting the rights of the subscriber you need to have that knowledge so the composition of at least the, the team within uh within uh, PLDT is actually a hybrid so these are product people these were um some it's a mix between product people, compliance people, technical people, and even um, what do you call this? Uh, paralegal mm. and legal. So it's a it's a blend, right, of people coming together to really understand the issues around the processing, so that we can bridge the potential uh, gaps and really provide. Um, uh, guidance in terms of how to mitigate certain risks. So that's the level. Again, that is, I think, the requirement already of a mature privacy practice. And all the more, um, you know, if you want to do AI. Right. Yeah. And, I, and I'm also seeing more and more, uh, I don't know, you might know of you already, of uh, people who are creating hybrid careers. No? Uh, for example, they they maybe uh, have a legal background and they're studying taking yeah. masters in data science and by I although I do see more often it's the people from the compliance side studying the data science and less so <laughs> the data science the people going the other way you know um I don't know could be a bias but no anyway what I wanted to ask was obviously this thing doesn't happen in a vacuum do you have any thoughts about how we encourage that hybrid uh role no? obviously uh, education internal and external plays a role did you encounter that kind of journey in your in your current capacity, like educating people from both sides? Um, okay, so we have actually a, a heavy uh, education program internally because we affect how people actually do, let's say, uh, product development. We, so we're part of the life cycle of product development. So from part of assessment and as and at the same time from a deployment standpoint, then. Uh, from an education standpoint, we have actually uh, by by monthly, I think, by monthly communications to to uh, the organization. No, and the way we do it is we do it with humor, mm. because data privacy is a very heavy topic. Yeah, you can need to ground it in things that uh, they understand on a personal level. So we actually also have a monthly podcast. And the podcasts are discussions on everyday life, but we inject privacy. So, for example, the you know we actually had an episode on let's say uh, what do you call this? We had an episode uh, for Valentine's, and mm-hmm. it's about relationships, right? Sharing data 
and we talked this about is, this is an internal one or is it it's an internal one okay. it's, an, no, it's an internal one we don't share it because we talk about cases eh. we sure. talk about cases because people need but we talk about it in a humorous way and these are the podcast is actually uh, between three of my heads mm-hmm. one is the host and then nagbabatuhan lang sila and they're and and it's fun. I'll send you a clip so you can see it because mm. it's a again it's a discussion on privacy, but it humanizes it, right? Right, and brings it to the level where I can understand it because you can't. I I don't think you can. Uh, you can expect the organization to practice. I mean, at least I mean majority of the organization to practice it if they don't understand how it applies to them. Right, so we had to bring it down. Even our communications prior to this year's podcast was, you know, we had, uh, and I can share that with you. We had videos, and this was like office setting, right? Talking about uh, uh, sharing of password, you know, sharing of information, keeping information in your laptop, you know, yeah. things that yeah. we normally take for granted. People normally take for granted, but that those into things that for, for from a privacy standpoint things that you need to watch out for because you could be the source of the breach yeah right and and really human it's actually people it's the i mean humans are the number one cause not the technical right the unless you have a link. major yeah the weakest link because people forget or people are in a rush right and even if isa isa lang yan right you don't know kung sino yun and how much of the data was exposed right because again, we take it for granted, and that's 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 the reason why we had to bring it down to a personal level, and again use humor so that people absorb the message better, and actually relate, related to their own personal life, right? And I think for AI, again, depends on how massive you're doing it. Uh, I think your privacy education should cover. If you're doing it for us, it's projects, right? Limited for now, but in terms of the, you know, if it affects our entire operations, then yes, you would need, I think, massive education on on it so that people understand, especially if everyone's be accessing that tool already. Yeah, so that brings up a very good point. No, I just uh, realized it now. So in uh, in traditional tech, call it that, no, non AI tech. There's a there's a there's a difference between educating the builder of the tech, the developer, and then the user of the tech. And obviously, maybe because of bias, I tend to encounter more yeah, education yeah. for the for the builder, no? Or dapat ganon. In AI, it's even worse or more complex because with the large language model, suddenly we because before. If you were a user of AI, probably you were the builder. So you were you were the ones who coded it. But yeah. now with the large language model, you now have created a, parang a two tier society. There are people mm-hmm. who just do prompting and use it, yep. not needing to know how it works, or maybe they should. And then you have the builders now. So how do you see that playing out from a, I guess that awareness standpoint? How do we? Is there a difference, or there should there be a difference on how we educate both, the designer of the tool and the user of the tool? Well, the designer of the tool will have to be more rigorous, I think, right? So the same way that we do privacy, the rigor that we apply, that we expect uh, the builder to have, right? Really understanding the systems, really understanding the data flow, uh, it's it would be the same for an AI implementation, if not more so, right? Because before, it's just the, the systems and the data flow. Now, it's even the interactions that we need to map out. Right. So this, for example, that one that I said, not the the one for credit, we had we had to have them detail the call path. Because again, it's in those things, right, that determines the potential discrimination. That's where the risks are, and that's those are the things that we need to mitigate. Um, for the uh, what do you call this? And at the same, so a lot of times though, the 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 builder that you know, doesn't understand doesn't understand the data flow that well or the systems that they're connecting to. So that's where that's usually where the bottleneck happens. Well, and then there has to be a different one for the people who are using it. So the way we do it is bespoke depending on the unit. Mm-hmm. 
because again, their experience is very different, and our and our expectation as well has to be, uh, has to be different for both. Yeah. In terms of ano, um, champagne, I'm poking around now just to give people context now because it's really good to to be talking to. Well, I would consider PLDT to be relatively more mature considering the nature of the business now. But many businesses are not there. How would you approach? on the topic of privacy and AI safety, how would you approach educating the kind of the senior leadership or executive set in like an average company? Because uh, that might also be a big challenge no, in terms of adoption. Right. So there's, I think, a couple of ways that you could do it. The first way is, I mean, the most immediate, especially for a small company, right? If it's a, it's a small company or at least a, a medium-sized company, there are, from a privacy standpoint, right, which AI is going to be uh, attached to or vice versa, uh, both of those are, are connected, there is actually penalties, mm. right? That's the first thing. I mean, that's how also we started. There are penalties, therefore, we need to make sure we do this, Yeah. right? We do certain things, right? Because you don't want to get penalized because it's a repeti- it's reputational harm. It's not mm. about it's okay for and a small company of course the money matters right uh, for medium manageable but it's not about the money it's about the reputation because you will be you will most likely be called out by the regulators right they will publish that it will be you will be publicized so what does that you know uh, that will affect your share price that will affect uh, your in the, how your shareholders, your stakeholders perceive you because it's a, it that means it's weak governance in terms of how you operate, yeah. right? So that's the first message I think for any senior leadership to make sure that they implement and really listen to the privacy officer, right? And really look at okay, how do we do this, right? Uh, the next thing I think, especially if you are a company that's looking into your uh, sustainability rating, right? ESG. Privacy actually, ESG. Mm-hmm. Privacy actually plays a very big role in the governance and social aspect in terms of the rating. Uh, it's actually called out. Privacy and security is actually called out as a, as a section. Right, so if you're after uh, the ESG rating, all the then yeah, all the more you need to make sure that you actually do this, right? Because it affects your share price, uh, it affects uh, how you are perceived by companies, and at the same time, from a trust standpoint, right, of customers. If you look at, I, I forget who did that study, but uh, privacy and security. Uh, if if the rating for a company is actually high from an ESG of privacy and and security, then the trust as well of cons- uh, consumers uh, increases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Right. So I think those are the three areas. The most immediate is my penalty. Huto. I mean, and the penalty is admin fines. I'm sorry, but the DPA is the only one so far in my kolong. Which is right? odd. Potentially, no? the liability is contained. To the enforcer, but not really the perpetrator within a company. No, no, it is. It is uh-huh. the actual people that executed handled it the data. and ordered. Yes, handled the data and ordered it because okay. that means it's really, uh, you despite, let's say for example, despite your privacy officer telling you the dangers, you still proceeded. Yeah. Right. So you are at risk. So the, that's why we take uh. You know the proponents take it very seriously, and we actually have uh, they sign off accountability uh, documents in the event that, for example, we implement they implement something that is that we deem as let's say medium risk. So they are required to implement within a particular framework, with I'm sorry, with a particular period, right? Because if in the and in the event that something happens, it's documented who is accountable. So again, the principle of accountability. It's the same for privacy. It's the same for AI, right? You need to know who who said yes to this, right? Who ordered what? Yeah, and uh, the liability can be a big driver of compliance. Pero yun nga eh, this is going to be a bit more Hollywood, no? 
it did doesn't seem to deter cases of cyber attacks or breaches, which yeah. are mostly us usually carelessness, if you think about it, or human error. Um, of course, I'm talking about the I uh, know the high profile cases, but shouldn't that also be a, a driver for security if we, we think about liability, personal liabilities or institutional liabilities? Well, I know that they're trying to do an act for cybersecurity that mm -hmm. actually has some penalties. So let's see, right? Because yes, you're right. There, there is. Um, it becomes organizations need to take it, they take security more seriously, especially yeah. if they're handing so much data. Right. And if they don't, then there there has to be some penalties involved. And I think you will see that more and more with the regulators, yeah. right? And how they are enforcing it. Yeah. There are a couple um, of house bills already, okay. actually. Yeah. Sorry, now I was saying there are a couple of house bills in terms of AI. And I'm sure there's also cybersecurity because we we feel it, right? We feel it. So it but it's a matter of how do you how do you uh it's about enforcement. I always say, regardless of the policy, and even internally, you don't do a you don't do policy that you're not willing to enforce, right? It's in the enforcement that's critical. Yeah. Um. Since we're on the topic, I don't know how much has the term differential privacy come up locally because I notice it doesn't seem to be a commonplace discussion or I mean I'll be specific but what I mean about differential privacy is uh in a way it's a blend of the data science and privacy field eh, where you try to first measure if you redact certain portions of let's say a data set how much does that affect the output of a model that's one part hmm. and the, I guess the most extreme on the AI side is synthetic data na, no? so if you don't want your medical records getting compromised. You use AI to learn that and come up with fake data that as a whole behaves similarly to the original with a few losses of info for sure. But you won't be able to trace the individuals anymore. It sounds very fancy, you know, but has that come up in your journey or discussion at all? And do you see that becoming relevant in the future? I think that will be in the area of data minimization, what we call data minimization. Yes. Right, wherein you really just touch on data that you need. But you're right, you need to test certain things, right? So that's also a question that we have uh, a lot of times when you know when proponents come to us and say, I wanna I wanna capture this much data, so and so and so and so forth, right? So we ask the question, what's the objective again? What for? <laughs> because it, right, what what for? Right? Because you can't tell me you need a hundred data points that you're trying to collect with the customer, especially if you're trying to change, let's say, a customer form. Like, uh, why? Why, why, why do we need that data? No, because so and so and so and so. Like, do we really need that data? That much data? Or can what what is critical to the model? So we ask those questions. Yeah. Right? So but it is the task of the proponent to actually really study what is the critical data points that they need. Because I think, I think, I'm sorry, but it's so, it's so 2000 already to talk about, I want as much data to gather as much data, right? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. we're, we should be at the stage already that we can determine that the data that we actually need for a particular analysis and study it, right? Now, if you need more, then okay, let's inject more, let's inject more. Right and do it in a safe environment, a test environment before we actually deploy it to the entire thing. Yeah. Because deploying to the entire thing would also mean that we need to be transparent to the data subject about the data that we're collecting and, and what the, and what we are using it for. So you'd better be certain. So the test, the testing has to be very uh, rigid. I think, right, yeah. but definitely. Data minimization is critical, uh, especially when you're doing, let's say, uh, disposal, because there's a requirement as well in BIR for you to, for us particularly, to retain certain amounts of data, right, uh, of our subscriber, mostly because, you know, paying taxes and, right. you know, with that objective. Hmm. But so that means that we don't need to retain, let's say, gender, religion, 
which are right? irrelevant to a tax regime. No? Yeah. Dapat, no? yeah. 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 Which is irrelevant to the objective as to why we need to retain that data after the subscriber has, let's say, opted out already of the service. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So th- that's that's something that we're also uh you know we're promoting with the with the what do you call this uh with the proponents. So I mean it has we've we've already achieved uh, quite a lot, but there's still a lot of there's still some some areas where we need to purge data. Right? Because I mean the more you keep, the more you need to to secure it. Right? Yeah. Especially and if you don't need it, why would we want that risk? Yeah. Right? So, Actually, it brings to mind yeah, this is another Hollywood type question. No? Na, the on the never ending conflict, but baka cliche lang between innovation and compliance. No, is that kind of a tired trope? In your in your sense, does should there be a conflict, or is that conflict actually exist? Because it means that that's the it will uh, always, I think, exist because there's this what the people believe fast over perfect. Right, yeah. I would, from a privacy standpoint, we always say, "Can it be right first? Mm. Right, it has to be right, and then we can talk about it not being fast. So, and being right means you understand the data flow, you understand what systems it connects to, right? And there will always be, uh, there will always that conflict will always exist with some because they don't they're used to a certain mode of operating but even they have to pivot right and evolve and i think that is a requirement for everyone that they need to evolve the way they work because now the expectations are different yeah given the expectations not just of regulatory but of consumers right and if you lose the trust of the consumers, then we there's no business to talk about. Yeah, that's the end of right? everything. At then, yeah, it's the end of everything. At then, right? So it has to be it has to be what is right. Uh, do you have legitimate purpose to actually process this data? Are we being transparent with the subscriber? Are we being proportionate? So again, the 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 thing on proportionality, right? That's mm-hmm. the where the data minimization comes in as well. Right? Are we processing data appropriate, proportionate to our objective, or is it excessive? Because if it's excessive, then then let, let's make sure that we're only touching the data that we really need, right? But again, if you're coming from the old school of more data means better results, not 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 really, mm-hmm. right? The right data means better results. The correct data means better results, right? Yeah. Accurate data means better results. It's not about the quantity. It's about the quality of the data. And people need to really move. Again, it's a very 2000 type of thinking, <laughs> right? Which when people started... Three, almost three decades ago na pala, no? You know, people... Yeah, but people are still... Pe- yeah, people there. kind of forget that. People yeah. are stuck there, right? Because yeah. now they have more tools, I think. Now, because there are more tools, then all the more they want to play with it. But, you know, but playing with data is a responsibility there has to be a better appreciation i think of data its value and its life cycle to yeah. be able to really properly uh, use it and that's what we espouse uh, with all of the proponents i mean I, I'm, I'm i'm saying that there will always be that conflict because there's always going to be that one two people that is a bit stuck there Mm-hmm. But because it is also a compliance issue, then they are forced to. Anyway, no. Right? But at anyway. least at least have a better attitude towards it, more productive yes. attitude. But okay. but you know, from the time that we started in twenty uh seventeen when we set up the office, I think we've already achieved a lot. And it is actually very pervasive in the entire organization. And sometimes sometimes the man people are overly cautious. Right. So, but that's okay, right? That's okay. Uh, but then we, you know, when we, when we, when they talk to us, and go, no, that's okay because we have to. Our uh, what we need to do is really about explaining why, so that they understand better. Because it's not just about yes, no, right? When it comes to pri- privacy, it's highly contextual, right? So, 
uh, just as just like any prompt that you have in AI, it's highly contextual. Right? So privacy, the practice of privacy is highly contextual. We need to understand why you're using it, what is it for, so be able to assess whether, yes, you can use it. Yes, you can do that. It's not a straight out no. And if you talk about innovation, yeah, is privacy or AI governance a deterrent for innovation? No. But again, I'm a privacy practitioner, but it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Because it's supposed to actually propel you to be able to do things better. So be that better imagine, business. yeah, better business. Imagine if a subscriber or a, your customer complains because you process the data. And, then, and it, it, it actually reaches to the point where it becomes a big complaint in the NPC. Then, then your entire reputation is gone. Do we yeah. really want, do we really want to get that, uh, to, to, to go that far, right? The objective of any privacy officer is to mitigate the risk. Right. Okay. I'm just being conscious of the hour, no? Um, bilis, no? <laughs> We're nearly at the hour. Oh, no. Uh, oh. So, maybe the a few more words. Obviously, the AI space continues to evolve. The AI Act will not be the last. And at some point, there will probably be a Philippine AI Act of some sort. Yeah, um, I know that there's there's uh, several bills already. Because uh, eh. so some congressmen are doing a couple... So any uh, for now at least any parting thoughts about what people should be conscious about when it comes to AI AI safety privacy and thoughts about uh you know if there were maybe top 3 things you would look at in a development of such a bill or such a law uh, because I'm so sure this conversation will probably reach a number of government uh, people watching well what would the, you know what would your two cents be on that well, I, I talked about earlier the robustness, right, of your data. So it's the accuracy of your data. You need to to prepare any AI implementation has to make sure that the data is accurate, right? Garbage in, garbage out. You can't expect the tool to fix that, yeah. right? If it's wrong, it's wrong. Uh, and it will actually amplify things further if mm -hmm. you actually don't fix it from the source. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I would recommend to companies Look at your data. How you how are you managing your data? How are you governing the data? And how are you ensuring the accuracy of that data? Right? Because any any tool, right? AI or any other tool that you may look at in the future will depend on the accuracy of that data. Yeah. Right. Second is um, accountability, right? The data or the processing that you are doing has to be traceable. Right and auditable, because you need to know if something is actually uh, is actually wrong, and you need to know where to fix it. Because the privacy rights actually affords uh, every citizen uh, the you know uh, the right to actually exercise its power, right? Uh, to to erasure, to edit, right? So I need to be able to know where the potential error occurred, hmm. right? So traceability and accountability, right? Auditability has to be there. Then third is specification, right? You need to be very clear about the business rules that you are prompting the tool, right? Because like I said, that, that example on uh, the YouTube, right? You can't just say, I want X number of, I want uh, engagement, uh, increase in engagement. Increase in engagement, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's so open. Mm -hmm. So the, the case of YouTube is when it happened, right? It was ex exposing uh, content that was so ex extreme. Extremist, right? So Data. mission accomplished. Engagement is mission up. Oh, <laughs> engagement is up. But then you are influencing, right? People potentially serving fake news. Yeah. Right? So without knowing it. Right? So you need to be conscious of, uh, of, again, you have to be conscious about how you could potentially affect, right? Influence people. And yeah. I'd like to actually read, you know, because the UNESCO actually had uh, an... Hey, uh, principles, no? They have ethical yes, principles. Yes, ethics. Mm -hmm. And I actually like 
this uh this this excerpt coming from uh the assistant director general so i'll just read it because it's actually you know i was talking about ai being affecting the uh the social condition you know, yeah the, the social condition. condition right the human condition right so she said in no other field is the ethical compass more relevant than in uh, artificial intelligence this general purpose technologies are reshaping the way we work interact and live the world is set to change at a pace not seen since the development of the printing press centuries ago. AI technology brings major benefits in many areas, but without the ethical guardrails. It risks producing real-world biases and discrimination, fueling division, and threatening fundamental rights and freedoms. Right? I think that's so critical. We need we we're not here to stop it, you know. You know, talk about innovation, right? Innovation and conflict with compliance. It shouldn't be about stopping it. It's just how do you ethically use it? Yeah. How do you make sure that you use it so that you don't cause harm? Right? So every time the, the perspective that we take when we're assessing, uh, particularly AI or any, actually any processes, what is fair to the data subject and what is right? And that's what we look at. And that's why I read that quote because I'm like, that's it. It's really about the human condition that we need to, you know, that we need to safeguard. And it again, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we govern ourselves properly and we make sure that the practices that we do is, you know, fair to the data subjects that we are processing. All right. I think that's probably the best place to end it for now. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, Leia for... Uh, Thank you. giving us this time and for I think we barely scratched the surface obviously uh, yep. as with one hour is barely enough but I think we were able to flesh out a significant amount of uh, uh, of the topic and more importantly what, what it really the impact to me was we need a hybrid practitioner I think that's yes. one of the best takeaways the privacy practitioner is not a compliance person only no uh, you need a blend of someone and product uh, ownership also need that the data people are there too so it, it requires multi multi uh, discipline multi discipline uh, yep. stakeholders okay so uh, yeah thank you very much for coming Leia and thank hope, you hope to have you again in a future episode thank you very much happy weekend thank happy you weekend.